everyone and welcome to Grace Cove Church. Whether you're watching from your lounge or else you, or you're joining us from the auditorium, it is so good to have you with us today. Know that wherever you're joining us from, you are family, we love you, and we continuously are praying for you. Today is a very special day. It is Women's Day and as women we sometimes take a little bit extra and so now we've labeled it Women's Month, uh, which is a little cheeky but so good <laughs> for us speaking as a woman. So today we are going to be having a special lineup for you. We're going to be uh, just hearing some stories from some of the women in Grace um, as well as Craig is going to be looking at, at some of the women in Acts during his preach in our Acts Alive series. So welcome, it's good to have you with us and we are looking forward to, to just having God touch us and for us to be a blessing for others as we go into worship now. of your 
denied that the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me, you know, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free Always free indeed I'm a child of God Yes I am Free at last He has ransomed me His grace runs me While I was asleep 
So coming up this week, we have a very special Grace United. It's the first time in many months where we can come together and pray on site at 145 Glover. We also will be streaming at the same time via Facebook Live as usual. And so you can join us either online or on site. And so we're looking forward to seeing you on Wednesday night, seven o'clock. Our called ladies um, event, month long event, continues every Wednesday at 7.30 or else on a Saturday at 3 p.m. So today we have an amazing treat for you. So what I've done is just called a few of my friends in church together just to tell us their stories. And they've got vastly different stories as we all live our own lives and face our own challenges. Um, so we all face different things. But this Women's Month, uh, it's great to celebrate just the strength that we have as women. And I was listening to a talk yesterday um, just from a friend of mine preaching and she happened to say that when we are strong women, it's easy for us to be broken when we're standing on our own strength. But when God gives you strength, that inner strength, and we rely on His strength, then actually we can't be broken um, and beaten because it's Him who gives us that strength. And so here on the couch with me right now, I have Lily. As she starts speaking, you'll recognize her voice. She works at the church office, and, and she's often the voice on the, other, on the phone, other side of the phone. And her daughter, Chloe, Chloe Nadu. And Chloe, you would recognize um, her strength if you've got kids. So she's normally out in the, in, with the kids and making them jump up and down and dance and do crazy stuff. So I'm going to start with you, Lily, and just talk to you a little bit about mothering. Uh, we had a staff meeting just a couple of weeks ago and you were talking about just how you celebrate Chloe like all the time about how um, just her whole conception was a hard fought prayed for battle and so you celebrate her every day so uh, tell us a little bit about that. I was going through a time where uh, I had to take fertility pills and it was a struggle because all my emotional, my hormones were hectic. I wasn't the same character. I wasn't quite, I wasn't, I was getting irritated all the time. And during that time, Mike just came to me and he says, I'm taking this pill now and I'm throwing it away. And I said, oh gosh, you're throwing my child away. That's the feeling I went through. And I cried out to God. I cried and I says, Lord, He's telling me to have faith. What is this faith all about? And I continued to cry. And then I was in a group of ladies who asked me, what do, prayer do you want? And I said to them, I want to be able to have my first daughter, have a partner, have a, a friend, have a brother or a sister that she can talk to. And my request was to have a second child. And I voiced my calling onto them and I said, this is how I feel, I'm broken. Um, in our Indian community, it's like you've got to have a whole lot of kids. And I didn't want to feel as if there's something's wrong inside of me. Um, so I cried out, I cried out to God and I voiced my opinion to the ladies. And God, God came through. Um, the ladies prayed, they continued to pray. And as you can see, as Chloe is here, she's sitting next to me. Chloe, you are a gift, and I've witnessed just this quiet strength, the, the courage that you attack life with, that you have bravely fought and won some battle. I'll just tell you again that you are a gift for God, that you were born for a time such as this, and it's a beautiful thing. So that was just one of the challenges that you faced. Another was later in life and not to go in details, but you had to pack up home quite rapidly, move to another city um, and almost cut off uh, many of your special relationships. And you were quite young at that stage, Chloe. Yes, I was, um, I was in grade six at that time and 
packing up and moving to a different like a different province it like affected me in such a way that I had to make new friends and um, a different culture at the same time and it did affect me going into a, a box stage and I got bullied um, but having facing battles and because at a such age I was had epilepsy and um, I got bullied but God made me I think in the, having that purpose God made me realize that you have certain battles in life and facing those battles in life you you can face anything by move, moving in a moved in a grapple state but in the end it it made me choose the career that I am today which is travel and tourism so I, I mean it's incredible just the things that you are accomplishing with your life Chloe and I think what speaks to me is just uh, particularly these days with your mask I just see these big eyes <laughs> but you have the ability to in a crowd but particularly for the younger kids and uh, not only but for younger kids you seem to be able to channel in and find the one that needs just some help and care particularly with with your history of bullying and so how does God speak to you how do you know just and find that strength and the courage to just step up boldly for for him um, I think because the one thing that I have that I've took notice is that during the years I needed to trust God I needed to stand up firm for for him and as well as um, knowing who I am in Christ and because I know who I am in Christ I can identify with people and with the, the children that are hurting I can identify with them because I've been through the situations with them and I can identify I can I can see uh, what they are going through and I can talk with them um, and tell them that they are not alone uh, God is with them wherever they are beautiful so my next guest if I can call her a guest is Renata Root and um, you would know her from just from praying uh, for her uh, for many times actually mm -hmm. so Renata tell us the story a little bit of your journey what you faced the last couple of years okay so in 2018 um, I fell ill and after a couple of doctors visits they eventually referred me to a specialist I had to go for an emergency operation and the next morning uh, the doctor came in and basically started with your battle starts now and uh, even though it was never on my mind I instinctively knew what he was going to say next and it was that they found cancer so obviously it was quite a shock for us we didn't expect something like that uh, but for some reason it was also I also had this amazing feeling of uh, calm, peace on me. And it's really that where they say it, it's basically uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. So the next couple of months at Loud Head, we had, uh, I had to go through several uh, surgeries and also um, chemotherapy. And um, it was about a year or so. Uh, that we had to, uh, that I had to go for treatment, and um, nine months ago, we got the news that I was finally in complete remission, and um, it's still that way. It's amazing. So what I loved about your journey is just your faithfulness, but also just that you just had such a conviction and that trust that Jesus was going to heal you. We saw you week after week unless you'd had a surgery in church and the joy that just shone out of you was actually unbelievable. So how did you keep your eyes on Jesus? For me it was just clinging to the promise and also more important clinging to the promiser. Um, you can go into the word and the promise that God gives you is rock solid. It's the truth. Mm. So good. And it's just really what I cling, cling to. And 
David Tom said, it, it, yes, it wasn't always easy. Um, and that's the thing, people don't always see what's behind the scenes, um, the times that you actually really have to face your fears. Um, and it sometimes feels like you're in the storm and you're just, you're just holding on. But that was the one truth that I could cling to. Um, I'm thinking particularly um, of uh, Jeremiah 29 verse 11, where the Lord says, um, for I know uh, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And plans for a hope and a future and you know that's that's something for all of us mm. that we can really hold on to and if you if you read the the, um, the chapter just before that verse and also the rest of chapter 29 um, it actually uh, God never promised to take them out of the captivity immediately mm. it was actually 70 years but in that time he actually told them, live your lives. Um, you know, plant and um, just, you know, build your houses and dwell in them. And I think it's so important to, in the midst of the storm, to live your life and to live it well. Beautiful. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, the second part that you mentioned of the joy, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, during my journey, the Lord revealed to me that joy is a weapon sure and it was such a weird concept for me to grasp because it just doesn't feel like it fits together but if you think about it if you can have joy in the midst of suffering mm -hmm. yeah. it's actually um it's just amazing because it's like a twofold with two double-edged sword um you disable the enemy to use suffering to bring you down yeah and at the same time, you're glorifying God. Mm. So to have joy is, again, I think it's a, it's a choice that you make. Yeah. It's a decision. But also, when you, when you uh, allow God to lead, it just flows. It just, you can't help it. Because Love you it. know, it's, you know it's, it's God's plan, and it's His best plan. Yeah. Um, we often want to make plans, and uh, we want to take things in our own hands, especially if we don't know what the future holds. But you do come at the end of your own strength, and it's at that place where where you can actually surrender and allow to God take to take over. And sure. there's a, that peace that comes with it, and there's a joy that comes with it. Yeah. And I think that's just where God always came through for me in the most difficult situations. And every time that just allowed my faith and my trust to actually be built upon that. It's beautiful. So good. <laughs> I'm getting a bit lost in your story here. <laughs> so I read um, just a blog yesterday and it said there's, there's one word difference in why is this happening to me to why, why is this happening for me. Just building on that verse in Romans 8 where Absolutely. God says God turns all things to good yes. for those who love us. Yeah. And I just want to commend you just for how you fought this fight, just the strength of facing the battle, just you and your husband, how just you face it with faith, mm -hmm. with perseverance, with holding on to God for believing in His strength and, and not your own. And so well done, well done, Belinda. Thank you. <laughs> I've got our friend Annette Agutu with us today, and she is an amazing woman. In fact, I can't even... Um, understand some of the degrees and, and things that, that she has here, Annette. <laughs> and so I'm just going to ask Annette to tell us a little bit about um, who she is and what she does. And um, yeah, just when I think of you, Annette, I just think of you as a modern day Lydia, someone, a woman of influence who who just really ashes in the kingdom of God. Hey, thank you so much, first of all, for the invitation to uh, be one of those that you uh, really is showcasing in this uh, Women's Day program, and I am glad about it. Now, regarding being a woman of influence and following in the footsteps of Lydia, and I'm so glad you've picked on this topic. Mm -hmm. In my view, I don't think any of us really has a choice. The day we are born, we are actually born to influence, whether for good or for bad. Daily, we have to make a choice as to how we use our giftings, positions, 
blessings and opportunities that God has given us to influence society for either good or bad. Well, for me, my journey in love in life has opened doors for me to advance in the academic uh, arena, particularly uh, in the field of international tax, which is the field of my specialization. And it has opened for me doors to meet with uh, various people, uh, both my peers in this country, people at national level and at international level, and these are mainly policy makers uh, on international tax issues. And I'm aware in all my engagements of the type of influence I should have in these engagements as a child of God. So you touched on that you work in all these different Fields. I think you've just received a new UN appointment. So tell us about that. Well, uh, the UN appointment is uh, basically the UN set up uh, a high level panel and it's supposed to look into financial accountability, transparency and integrity so as to achieve the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, a panel of about 17 people were selected in the entire world and uh, I think it's about three of us from Africa and we are looking at all these issues and literally providing um, guidance to the UN member countries. And while that is going on at international level, uh, I, I mean at national level in the country, I'm on the Davis Tax Committee that is reviewing the country's tax system. And we are working together with SARS, looking at the tax gap the country is facing and how COVID-19 has also impacted on the country and what can be done as a country, you know, to fill that gap. So it's, it's quite a high jump and it's like squeezing water out of the stone. So you have <laughs> with ideas both at national level and literally giving guidance uh, going forward. It's a tall order, but I think for me, approaching it from the values that I have, because people are trying to pull from different angles. Remember when it comes to tax, it's about protecting countries' interests. Mm -hmm. And I am very firm on protecting the interests of developing countries. And there, I, I just literally say it as it is. So I've read the stuff. I understand what I'm talking about. So putting down your foot. This is how we go. These are developing countries' concerns. And that is how I'm able to bring in my influence. But I always have a subtle agenda. Wow. God and how things must be run according to Christian values will always underpin the kind of either policy advice that I give out in any of these forums. Yeah, stunning. So when we say you're a woman of influence, we're not lying. <laughs> <laughs> but Annette, you're an amazing mentor to many of us and I love you. Speaking to you again after so long, miss you. <laughs> so this is my friend, Daphne Cowie, and many of you would know her from seeing her um, around church. She bakes the rust every week for us and what some of you may not know is that her and her husband Mike Cowie planted this church many many years ago and she is still a faithful part of the same body which is amazing in itself. And I have witnessed how many people you have impacted whose lives you've changed, the faithful prayers and investments you've made in people's lives how rich and rewarding and how one day when you get to heaven you're going to be i think in the front of that queue <laughs> where god is going to be saying to you well done my faithful servant and so the thing i, I remember about you in church and think when i think of you i think of you with your bible always and giving many words from that bible to people and so how do you hear the word and the voice of God so clearly for so many? The, the thing is, Mike said many years ago, um, what we need to trust in is who God is mm. and 
he will do, he is who he is, says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. And so, to me, the word is very important. Um, how you say how we hear it. Sometimes I read a scripture that I've read for ages and it just sort of jumps out to me. It's just like it's special. Um, one of them is, and this is also that has kept me, because if you have a role, like you say, Mike and I, with the church, people have a perception of you, but you also have this voice behind you condemning you the whole time. Mm. That is a constant thing, no matter whether you are the least or the most. Such you can be so successful. And I remember one day reading where Moses um, wanted to see God's glory. And God comes and he declares who he is. And this is what Mike says, to know who God is. When God comes and he says, I'm the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. And it's that thing of when the devil comes, and you can say, no, but God is like this. Growing up thinking that God is this being in the clouds coming and watching you so that he will beat you whenever you put a foot out of place. That was my perception. And then learning that God is a faithful God and he doesn't condemn us. It's the devil who comes to condemn us, but that God is a, has got a father heart towards us, is compassionate and gracious. And I mean, then over the years, when you, you learn that God is good, his word is good, and you can trust in it. And then there are treasures, many treasures in the word, when you just open it up. I mean, I've got my favorite scriptures. When that condemning voice comes, and you know, okay, Lord, I have failed. 1 John 1.19 if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm. I mean, over the years, when I've been desperate and I've read the word and I've seen it. So in the scriptures, there are, as I said, many treasures. Yeah, stunning. Yeah, I love what you say about knowing your enemy, to know that the devil does come to just tear us down, break our uh, identities, and just that if you know who God is, yes. you know who you are. Yes. And um, so, but just that, how did you find that calling, that, that thing that makes Daphne Daphne, that thing that uh, when you do it, you just feel the smile of God on you? No, it, by accident. Yeah. Because I would rather be in the background. I'd rather not sit here. Yes. <laughs> so, yes, i rather, I do not love washing dishes, but I'd rather wash dishes than speak to people. But it's that thing of, Mike has also said, as you go, because mm. often people say, what is my purpose? And he says, go and do something. And then when you do it, you will find yes, so whether God's approval is on it or whether you just get pleasure out of it. Mm. And when you get pleasure out of it, it encourages you, and then you will do it again and again and again. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Church Online, to you guys here in the building on site. Welcome to you. And uh, for you guys connecting via YouTube, it's great to have you with us this morning. I want to remind you that whether you're at home or in the building, we are building a community at Grace Cup Church. Not just people that attend a meeting and watch. You can watch on a screen. You can even watch in the building. We want to build a community. So why don't you jump on the comments and even just greet people. Say, I'm here. I'm watching as well. Perhaps you want to reach out to a friend on, on, on text or another way. Maybe as the Lord puts something on your heart, you'd love to share that in the comments. We want to go beyond just meeting with the screen in between us to interacting and engaging as we do life together, even in these kinds of circumstances. So welcome to episode 11 of Acts Alive. This morning, we're looking at Acts Alive Influencer. So we've seen over the last weeks how ordinary people empowered by the Holy Spirit can do extraordinary things how they can face uh, triumph in the face of crisis and difficulty, 
and how they can live lives that count beyond simply surviving the current troubles and just hanging on, hoping for better days. That's so tempting to do right now, isn't it? I wonder if I could ask you to think about this for a moment. Just settle your hearts. I'm going to ask you an important question. Think about this. When was the last time you had a great triumph? Or sadly, maybe the last time that you had a great sorrow? Just think about that for a moment. I want to ask you, in that moment, did you have someone to call that you could share the joy or the burden of that news, that event with? Could you phone someone up and share your heart with them? When I say that, I don't mean did you go, were you able to post online and have your Facebook friends like and comment? Or, or to, to put it out there on social and see if you can get a couple of hearts. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm asking, did you have someone to call? Someone who knows you, who's aware of your journey, who's up to date with your life. Someone that can roll up their sleeves and get stuck in to do whatever it takes to help you because they are committed to you as a friend. Someone who will genuinely share your successes and not be put off or jealous because you have succeeded. Someone who will pray and carry your burdens as though it was your own or their own. I wonder if you have someone like that, man. If you don't, God puts the lonely in families. There's people around you. You've just got to look out for them. You see, as we've journeyed through the book of Acts and we've in our series Acts Alive, we see how this rampant, explosive gospel spread from very humble beginnings, which were predominantly Jewish in small little communities, to eventually reaching every culture and class of society, every language group and every corner of the known world. The scope of Acts, the book in the Bible, covers 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine Mediterranean islands. Isn't that amazing? How big the scope of what the gospel accomplished in this one book uh, was able to do. But we also see that with the increasing spread of the gospel, the result was increasing difficulty and opposition. On just a practical point of view, there was more traveling, more ship journeys, more time out in the open, more exposure to risk. On a spiritual or political point of view, there was greater and greater opposition from without. You see we, see, we see that the gospel expansion came with a price. At first, the Roman Empire just simply ignored Christianity, thinking it was some kind of obscure Jewish development that posed no threat to the empire. But as hundreds and then thousands and ultimately hundreds of thousands of people became born again and gave their allegiance to King Jesus, even Rome was threatened. At the beginning, it was just the Jewish leaders who were jealous of what was happening with the Christians. But eventually, even the Roman might was fearful that this was a new uh, a threat to their mighty empire. And one of the keys to this gospel expansion is that of the deep relationships and the camaraderie which united the people from vastly different backgrounds, different personalities, different giftings, and bound them together in loving and supporting partnerships that could take the world for Jesus. You see, every one of these people had many that they could call in triumph or tragedy. And so this morning, as we honor our ladies on this special Women's Day, we're going to take a look at the book of Acts, but we're going to have a focus on some of the roles that women played in this book. Romans chapter 16, it reads like this. I commend, you, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Chentria, which is just outside Corinth. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been a benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets in their house. Greet my dear friend Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. So let's have a look at some of the ladies that we encounter in the book of Acts. 
The first one I want to talk about this morning is this lady called Tabitha. Tabitha, we read about her in Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. It says in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, in Greek her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About this time she became sick and died and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. When Peter arrived, he was taken to the upstairs room. All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and the other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. The Bible says that Peter prays and he says to her, Tabitha, get up. And she opens her eyes, resurrected from the dead. Now the lady that we start off first, this lady, lady Tabitha, she's not a great preacher. She's not a great teacher. In fact, she's not known for upfront ministry. But why we begin with her is the more, more people than not that I talk to day in and day out seem to put themselves down rather than are too proud. Most Christians think that they have just a very small and insignificant role to play in the kingdom of God. And the big jobs, the big work should be left for those other fancy people, whoever that other people is. And I want to start with finding just some lady who's relatively behind the scenes. And yet she counts for Jesus. She's not a prophet. She's not a preacher as some women were. We know that the Bible says she was a disciple. More than that, we don't know her role in the church. What we do know is that she was full of good works. Full of good works. Can you imagine if someone was speaking about you in the congregation and said, Oh, so-and-so, man, they are full of good works. What a wonderful thing. Constantly doing char charitable deeds. She made clothes and gave them to other widows. She herself could have been a widow, but she was respected and valued by that local congregation so much that when she got sick, the church gathered together to pray. And when they heard that Peter the apostle was nearby, they sent to bring him to pray for her. This was a lady that the church was concerned about. We see that she's raised from the dead and just that by itself, is an example and an evangelistic uh, moment for those around her. So what is it that Tabitha teaches us? I think Tabitha teaches us to live with a servant heart. There's some beautiful things she shows us. She shows us love in action. She spent time doing good works, not just saying good things. She shows us love in action. She shows us amazingly how to live healed. You see, too many of us uh, uh, make our address at the point of our pain. And in life, we will all go through trouble. We know that so well. But many of us will camp there. We, we, we put our roots and we, we make our foundations. That we, we own our address and that becomes who we are. Tabitha was a widow. Yet the Bible tells us that she overcame the pain of her loss so that she was able to minister to other widows. She found a way to live healed that she could um, minister the love of God to other peop people who were struggling with the same experience. <laughs> um, Tabitha teaches us to bloom where we planted. Many of us would say, oh, if I had an easier boss, I'd be able to shine Jesus better at work. If, you know, if I had more money, I could be more generous. If, if I wasn't so busy, I could pray more. We often think it's my circumstances that hold us back. But this lady... Tabitha bloomed where she planted. She bloomed where she planted. She had gone through some stuff in life, but she chose to have a great attitude and pour the life of God into those around her. Now, the final thing that Tabitha teaches us is she teaches us to embrace her second and third act. We speak about our first act being our school years, our study, and then our job. This lady had had a family. She'd been married. Now she was widowed. Her life had gone into the next day. She could have just sat on a rocking chair. I don't know what they would have done and, and wild her final years away. But no, she embraced her second act. She found a purpose for this next season of her life. She made it count. Tabitha teach, teaches us to live with a servant heart. The second lady we'll talk about this morning is Mary. Now Mary, this Mary was John Mark's mother. And uh, we read about her in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. 
It says, when this had dawned on Peter that he was released from prison, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. So during the first few centuries of, of Christianity, there were no fancy church buildings. The cathedrals and all of that came much, much later. And so the church would meet in either outdoors or in the homes of affluent people who welcomed them uh, to meet in their houses. And so local groups of believers gathered together in houses large enough to accommodate their church gatherings. And one of these early house churches was ho hosted by this lady called Mary, who was John Mark's mother. Mary was most likely a wealthy widow. She was originally from Cyprus and she was related to Barnabas. She became Peter's friend because of Peter's involvement with the congregation in her home, so much so that Mary's son, John Mark, got to know Peter, became his assistant, and eventually became an apostle in his own right and was instrumental in writing the Gospel of Mark. And so Mary would have been well off and influential. She would have been from the upper classes because she had slaves in her home. She allowed the church to meet in her house. You know, when Peter was arrested, the church is found praying in her home. At that stage, Herod, the ruler of Jerusalem, turned against the Christians and he persecuted them. James was just recently executed. Peter had been arrested and uh, there was great pressure on Christians. And yet Mary, encouraged, still has the church meeting in her home. And so where Tabitha teaches us to live with a servant heart, Mary teaches us to live courageously. She has a sense of godly stewardship of all that she has. She understands that what she has is not her own, but it belongs to God. And she's simply a steward or a manager of his resources. She puts the kingdom first. She lives a sacrificial life. Could you imagine having groups of people in your house most days of the week and many, many more on Sunday? Think of the mud stains on your carpets and the cups and saucers that get broken. Think of oh, just the general wear and tear of your home. <laughs> you know, um, often we ask for people to help us with hosting when we have visitors from the outside. And we find sometimes it's quite difficult for people to say, come to my house. I don't have much, but I can share it with you. People in our city feel like they've got to put on this wonderful thing. I can't tell you how many times when we have gone to minister at places, we go to the pastor's house to stay, the, the husband and the wife end up sleeping on the lounge floor or in the children's bedroom, and they give us their bed. Man, if you've got a bed, you can be sacrificial and let people be in your home. You know, when I just got saved, the church that I got saved into had some founder members. They were grandpas and grannies. Uh, their names were Laurie and Rose Hodson. And they were farmers. And when they sold the farm and moved into town, they built a house for themselves. You know the kind of house farmers build in town, right? And they had three garages. But they decided from the beginning, the church was still small and, and young. It, it hired a rotary hall and then a school hall for Sunday meetings. It had nowhere to meet in the week. And so above the garages, they built what they called the upper room. It had a kitchenette. It was open like an auditorium. It had a bathroom so that you could go to the, the, the bathroom right there. And they said from day one, this building will be for the church. You know, I remember my very first prayer meetings as a new believer in that upper room. I remember sitting and listening to men and women I came to respect as they mentored me and discipled me and taught me the deep things of the faith. I remember attending my first elders meeting in that upper room. I remember leading my first elders meeting in that upper room. It was just a, you might call them an old man and an old woman, but they chose to live a sacrificial life. They welcomed the church into their very home week in and week out for more than 15 years. You know, Colette and I got married in their garden because they were like Mary. They had learned to live courageously and open their doors to the things of God. Mary shows us courage to make tough calls in the face of danger, to stick to the fact that everything I have belongs to the Lord and I am at His service. Tabitha teaches us servanthood. Mary teaches us courage. The third lady is Lydia. We read about her in Acts chapter 16. It says, From Troas we put out to sea and we sailed straight to Samothrace. And the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi. 
and a Roman colony and a leading city of the district of Macedonia. We stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and we began to speak of the woman who had gathered there. One of them listening was a woman from the city of Thyatria named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. She said, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, then come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. This lady, Lydia, would have been a wealthy and influential business lady. She dealt in purple cloth. She was a Gentile and she had moved to Philippi where uh, politicians and high military officers lived so she could trade with them. They would have been her clientele. And she determines to provide the gospel with a beachhead into Europe. She's a lady with a heart after God, but she's not born again. When she hears Paul preaching, she becomes born again. She's the first convert to Christianity in the whole of Europe. <laughs> it would have been in Philippa. And, and she's the beachhead. Not only is she the first convert, but she's also instrumental with those other ladies at the prayer meeting in planting the first church and setting up the first base to see the gospel go into Europe. This was a special lady, right? The first salvation, the first church plant, only with women, <laughs> and the first base into Europe. She invites the apostles to stay in her home, and even the church meets in her home. You see, Lydia teaches us to live sacrificially. She begins by showing us a hunger for God. She's seeking God. She's regular in prayer, even before she was born again. Lydia also teaches us that small beginnings can be very significant. Can you imagine how a business lady and a few friends going outside in the open next to the river just to pray during the day? Those humble beginnings turn into the gospel all over Europe and increasingly west into the known worlds. She teaches us about selfless sacrifice. All that she had, her friendship circle, her standing in the community, the resources she had, the home, the money was offered to serving Jesus. This was a special lady who offered everything to her. The last lady that I want to talk about this morning is Priscilla. We read about her in Acts chapter 18 verse 2. It says there was a Jew named Aquila, a nature of Pontus. He and his, half, his, he and his wife Priscilla uh, had left Rome and had uh, run for their lives. In verse 18 it says, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and the sisters there and sailed for, Sir for Syria to Ephesus, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off to make a vow. When they arrived at Ephesus, he left Priscilla and Aquila, and he himself went into the synagogue, and he reasoned with the Jews. Now this is an amazing couple. They're always, always mentioned together, Priscilla and Aquila, which indicates that they were equal partners. Four out of the six times that they are mentioned, her name is first, which indicates that she was probably the powerhouse. She had the greater gifting, the more upfront call. They were also a cross-cultural couple. He was a Jew, she would have been Roman. So they move from Rome to Greece because they are running for their lives because of the persecution in Rome. They set up work there. Then they meet Paul. And then when they want to go and plant into Ephesus, they say, man, we can go and establish a business branch there. And so they go with Paul to set up the church there they, by, by making a base out of their business. The cool thing is, after three months, Paul leaves <laughs> and they have to carry on. Do you know that this couple move from Italy to Greece to Turkey? Three countries to be a base for the spread of the gospel. And so Priscilla teaches us to live strategically. She pursues her own gifting, but she's still in team with her husband. Isn't this beautiful? She might have the stronger gift. She might be more upfront, but she still works in team with her husband. She's strategic in her approach to the gospel. She uses her business to advance the kingdom. She doesn't just think, well, I'll do my thing during the week and I'll just bring the money by way of my tithe. No, she says, everything I have, my business should be set up so that I can get the gospel to other parts, a platform. I wonder what about you? You might say, I don't have a business. Yes. But what platform do you have? Perhaps your kids are going to a new school. Maybe there's a platform there. Maybe you're moving into a new suburb. Maybe there's opportunity there. 
Maybe you're starting a job. Maybe there's opportunity there. Maybe you're walking with ladies in your neighborhood. Maybe there's an opportunity there. Maybe you're getting involved with a new good cause. There could be an opportunity for the gospel there. Lydia, uh, Priscilla, was a possibilitarian. Everything she had, she looked for strategic opportunities to see the gospel advanced. The beauty is she's a team player. She doesn't hold her gifting back. She doesn't quieten herself down so that the people around her don't be put under pressure. She's strong with her, her, her gospel. She's even able to teach Apollos deeper things of, 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 of the truth. But she's also not pushy. She's not difficult to lead. And so, my friends, today we have these ladies who are able to teach us how we can live in a way that counts for eternity. You know, today, it's so easy for the dailiness of life to distract us from the kingdom of God. I want to say to us, we see in these ladies, when we compare ourselves, we have no excuse. We're left without an excuse. You see, every one of us gets to count for Jesus if we will just live for Him. We want to live for eternity and not just this life. Each of these women, who in the context of the day would have been the least likely candidates, every one of them, when born again into the kingdom of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, designed specifically by God, every one of them played a part in changing their world. I want to ask you this morning, will you use their example and find ways wherever you are to bloom where you planted and to see the gospel of Jesus Christ coming through you to wherever God has planted you? God bless you. So thank you, Craig, just for that um, incredible word. Our Acts Alive series has been so enriching and encouraging. And so for everyone, just remember to go and spoil all the ladies in your lives. Remember flowers, chocolates, especially chocolate, and just love on them a little and appreciate uh, what God is doing in and through them in their lives. So have a great week. We love you guys. Hope to see you soon.
Lost and dead, but your love came to find me. Jesus, you are the way. You are the way. I'm not the one.